Hi, Margaret. It's your dad calling. Um, I just have a few slides to show you here on um, aqueous solutions. Um, if you take a look at, I'm going to see how this works. Um, if you take a look at this slide, it's basically just organizing for you the kinds of things that you're going to do when ultimately writing reactions in aqueous solution. Um, the lab you did, you saw those videos. Most of them were forming precipitates, which you did really good at. The weak electrolytes are kind of tricky. That's when you're either making water or you're kind of neutralizing something. I don't think we saw examples of making a gas other than a couple, like when you added acid to a carbonate. Um, I can't remember any offhand. But um, that's what we're going to get right now. So how do you know if the, if the compound's going to be soluble in water? Um, now, your lab had to do with ionic compound, but molecular compounds do exist. Um, there are things like, I'm just going to make something up here, BCL3 is a molecule that is molecular. It doesn't break up into ions, um, and it um, is not ionic. And the way you could tell that is because you have non-metals are the elements that are in there. In the ionic compounds, you've got some kind of metal and then usually some kind of anion. Um, the metal is positive, of course, and the anion is usually negative. This is why you need the solubility rules when you're doing a problem like this, because no one can possibly memorize every possible combination. Um, there's so many elements on the periodic table that could lead to this, it's going to take you know, impossible effort to memorize them all. So that's why you have solubility rules. Let's take a look at a few of those. Some of these ions I know... All right, Margaret, what we've got here is one of the pages of the solubility rules that I use in my textbook. So let's look at those ions. I know a lot of them look familiar to you. When it's in this part of the table, you see that that thing is going to make a soluble salt when it's connected to um, something of the opposite charge. There are exceptions, though. Th these yellow part of the chart are telling you which ones do not follow the rule that's up in blue. So, for example, although... Um, sodium chloride um, is soluble. Um, according to this rule, AgCl is not soluble. So it's going to be a solid when it's in one of these equations, and it's never written apart. Because something's soluble, that's when you see Aq, so that if you go to a, an ionic equation, that guy's going to break up into Na plus and Cl minus. Okay? Let's take a look at this next one. Um, this is basically the book that I has has a separate table for soluble and insoluble, and um, it may take you a while to get used to using the table that you use for your class, which is why when the teacher gave it out and took them back, I wasn't sure why they did that. Here are the ones that are usually insoluble. So carbonates and phosphates and oxalates, chromates and sulfides, whenever you see kind of a thing that you normally think of a metal, let's say copper. Um, copper is Cu, and if it's connected to a carbonate, it's going to be CuCO3. If it's connected to a sulfide, um, it's going to be CuS. Again, this is a table that's principally insoluble with very, very few exceptions. Notice this guy here. That ends up being kind of important. Most hydroxides are insoluble, but barium hydroxide um, is a soluble salt. So if you go to an ionic equation you're going to have to write um, well, two of those. All right. Um, so the reactions occur by, quote, exchanging. So you can see what they've done here. They've taken the second part, or the anion, of one um, compound, and they um, are going to connect it to, they're going to swap places with the anion of the other compound. So you have AY and BX instead of AX and BY. It's these new compounds that you're comparing to the solubility rules. If one of them gives, let's say, a soluble compound, that thing is going to be ions in the ionic um, expression, so it's not going to really contribute to anything interesting. The things that are insoluble are the things that you can see are those precipitates, let's say. So here's a photograph of one that's in the top part. I don't know why the arrow didn't come out here. But this is a solution of um, lead nitrate 
it's a clear colorless solution and there's a clear colorless solution that the person is holding um, Ki. So the idea in an exchange reaction is that the lead is connected to the I so that you have a neutral compound and if you look it up in your solubility rules that ends up going to be insoluble and then you're going to get the anion here and the cation here. If you look at your solubility rules um, that's a soluble compound. Notice the stoichiometry here because this lead is connected to two nitrates you know that it's a plus two so it's going to have to get two iodides to connect to so that's got to be two in the expression. So if you take a look at everything here um, I'm just mimicking what I have above um, plus 2Ki you can see that those coefficients come in to, ke to keep account of the ion balancing. Um, they don't have a picture of this other one um, but it's similar in that the swapping of the ions leads to only one precipitate and the other thing is a um, okay whoops spectator ions. Here you could practice writing the reaction um, of four different precipitation reactions by looking at your solubility rules. I'll just pick this yellow one and you could do the others. So what they're saying here is that they're mixing K2Cr4 if you look on your solubility rules that's soluble and it's being mixed with the thing that's um, uh, up here I've got PBNO3 and that's also soluble but the new product which is the yellow thing they're giving you the answer here ahead of time is that lead chromate that's PBSO4 and then the other combination is going to be 2KNO3s notice how I had to do I took two of these and two of these made two separate plus one minus ones. Don't lump them together. Don't throw a two in the formula down here um, where it doesn't belong. Okay? Now the net ionic removes the spectators. So you're just going to keep the things that lead to the precipitate. And so I'm just going to go straight to the net ionic here and um, see what you get. All right. So um, what I just did... Uh, on the chart there was usually write the complete molecular equation and I went straight to the net ionic. I'm not sure what your teacher is going to ask you to do. They may ask you to do everything in every step. So the complete molecular is the one where everything is written together. And ionic, as it says, in which the soluble substances are represented by the formula of the predominant species. In other words, you're going to break those apart if they're strong electrolytes. Um, net ionic equation removes the spectators. Those are the guys that do not take part in the reaction at all. So um, these are good ones to practice with. So something on your own, maybe you could just write the net ionic equation that leads to these solids. So I'll just pick a random one here for you. Um, how about this one? Sb2S3. So sulfides are generally not soluble. Um, how am I going to make Sb2S3? Three, um, I just want to pick something that's going to lead to that solid. So how about if I pick something, a spectator, connect to the SB. This thing's called the antimony, by the way. Probably not an element that they're making you memorize. But since sulfides are always minus 2, um, this must be plus 3. So I'm going to go over here and just write down SB. A good, uh, a good thing that's a spectator is a chloride. And I notice I have two of those on the right, so I better have two here. And what am I going to write for a um, sulfide? So sulfide out of sodium. Sodium is a good standby. I'm going to need three of those. Uh, so I'm going to go Na2S and do three of those. So that's AQ, AQ. So if I mix all these guys together for the purpose of making this solid, I'm going to have some leftover ions, and it looks like I've got six NaCl. AQs. All right.